name is Dr. Asim and I am here with another teaching video from Clavity. So today we are going to discuss a very important topic that is management of diabetes mellitus. So the treatment of diabetes is mainly aimed at alleviating the symptoms and preventing the long term complications out of which cardiovascular complications is one of the major risk factor and the cause of death in diabetics. To enumerate the different classes, the first ones are those which increase the secretion of insulin from the pancreatic beta cells. They include sulfonylureas, megalitonides, DPP-4 inhibitors and GLP-1 agonists. Now there are another type of drugs which increase the sensitivity of receptors to the insulin which is being released. Now this type include classes like bigonides which has bitformin or another class like thiazolidine dions. There's another type of drug which is called the SGLT2 inhibitors which prevents the reabsorption of glucose in the renal fibrillar cells and hence decreasing the amount of glucose which is present in the body. The first choice of agent in patients with diabetes mellitus is bigonide which is metformin. Now patients on metformin can have GI disturbances like abdominal cramps and diarrhea and such patients need to be shifted on modified release metformin. Now another adverse effect of metformin is lactic acidosis which we need to keep in mind. Some of the contraindications of metformin include chronic kidney disease. Now patients who have a GFR below 45, need, we need to review the dose of metformin in such patients and if the GFR goes below 30, then we need to stop the, stop the drug. Now another very important point but that we need to keep in mind is that patients who are undergoing investigations with iodinated dyes need to stop metformin 48 hours prior to the procedure. Now metformin is considered the first choice of agent in patients with diabetes mellitus. But if there is any contraindication to metformin, for example the patient has a CKD or his GFR is less than 30, then we have a list of drugs to choose from. The drugs include DPP-4 inhibitors, pioglitazone, sulfonylureas, SGLT2 inhibitors, GLP-1 agonist, or meclitonides. So metformin remains the first choice of drug, but if there is any contraindication, then we can use any of these drugs as the first line agent. Now moving on to sulfonylureas. Sulfonylureas, drugs like glipizide, glipizide, or glipizide, these drugs, they increase the secretion of insulin from, from the beta cells of the pancreas. And hence, there is an increased risk of hypoglycemia in, with these drugs. In elderly, in patients with hepatic impairment, and particularly in patients with renal impairment. So moving on to the next class of drugs, which is megalitonides, repaglonide or neticlonide. So these drugs are also insulin secretor drugs. That is, they work by increasing the secretion of insulin. So any drug which works by increasing the insulin secretion has a risk of hypoglycemia, and hence, there is an increased risk of hypoglycemia associated with these drugs also. Now another class of drug which is the dipeptidyl peptidase 4 inhibitors, they also work by increasing the secretion of insulin. So there is an increased risk of hypoglycemia associated with these agents. However, the risk of hypoglycemia is lower than other class of drugs like sulfonylureas or megalitonides. Now, these, risk, these drugs are associated with an increased risk of pancreatitis or heart failure. Now, we know that, so there's a sort of mnemonic to remember this, that dipeptidyl is 4. So, the number which is coming is 4, and pancreas has 4 parts, head, leg, body, and tail, and heart has 4 chambers. So, we should avoid these drugs in patients with history of heart failure or any pancreatic disorder because there's an increased risk of pancreatitis or heart failure associated with this drug. Another very important class of drugs which is your thiazolidine dions, drug like pioglitazone. Now very important point that we need to remember about this medication or about this drug is that there is an increased risk of uh, causing bladder cancer, heart failure or fractures especially in women. Now if there is a person who is working in a dye industry and who is already at an increased risk of developing bladder cancer, so we should be very cautious in giving this drug to such patients. Now, if there's a patient who is presenting with uninvestigated macroscopic hematuria, which is, an which is a risk factor for bladder cancer, so this drug should also be avoided in such patients. So we have a few more classes of drugs. The first one being GLP-1 agonist. 
which increases insulin secretion and include drugs like exenatide or liraglutide. And the other class is SGLT2 inhibitors. Now they work by causing kidneys to excrete glucose in, into urine. So more glucose is excreted into the urine and thus the amount of glucose which is present in the body decreases. So and to enumerate the name of drugs they have canagliflozin, dapagliflozin and empagliflozin. So these drugs are, can also be used as the initial drug treatment if metformin is contraindicated or can be used in combination when we are giving the patient dual therapy or triple therapy. While prescribing oral hypoglycemic agents, the point that we need to remember is the weight of the patient because along with exercising anti-diabetic function, these drugs also have an effect on weight. Now there are certain medications which cause weight gain and certain which cause weight loss. So that to enumerate the drugs which cause weight gain are your sulfonylureas, pioglitazone. The drugs which cause weight loss are your SGLT2 inhibitors and your GLP-1 agonists. Now there is another drug which is KBP-4 inhibitor which has no effect on weight. So while prescribing we need to keep in mind that if the patient is morbidly obese or obese or has a BMI of more than 30, so we need to make the choice accordingly. So moving on further, Dr. Asim Hi guys and I, Dr. Jagyasa Saini are going to discuss a few of the clinical scenarios to help you get an in-depth approach in solving questions regarding diabetes and its management. Absolutely. So moving on to our first case. So our first case of the day is a 9-year-old boy who showed glycosuria during and immediately after an operation. A day later his urine analysis was normal. What is the single most likely diagnosis? In this case, the patient is suffering from stress-induced hyperglycemia. Whenever the body undergoes any kind of stress, such as a surgery or an infection, there is release of cortisol, which leads to hyperglycemia. And hence, this is a normal finding. So Jagyasa, how do we confirm that this is not an established diabetes, rather a normal post-operative finding? That's a very good question. Uh, so for the same, uh, the stress-induced hyperglycemia will not last for more than three days. And the test that we can perform is a fasting blood glucose, which will help us assess that a normal finding will help us assess that it is just a normal finding after, after uh, operation and not an established diabetes. So we, we call the patient back again after a week or so, yeah. and we do it as a follow-up investigation. Mm -hmm to confirm that this is a normal finding. So let's see who is our next case. A 41-year-old obese woman has recently undergone a blood test that shows a fasting blood sugar of 6 millimole per litre. So what is the single most likely diagnosis? The woman seems to be suffering from impaired glucose tolerance. Um, Dr. Asim, would you like to enlighten us about, a little bit about the various levels of any patient suffering from impaired glucose tolerance? Yeah, so we say a patient to have impaired glucose tolerance if the fasting blood sugar levels are anywhere between 5.5 to 6.9 millimoles per liter or if we check the levels two hours after oral glucose tolerance test and the levels between 7.8 to 11. Or yeah, for that matter, if we consider HPA1C, then it's between 42 to 47 millimole per liter. So this is this is when we classify the patient to have impaired glucose tolerance. Yeah, that makes sense. So our next case is a 45-year-old man who was scheduled for an elective hernioplasty. His past medical history includes non-insulin-dependent diabetes mellitus, diagnosed a year ago. He was advised to try diet and lifestyle medications first, and the patient claims to be following a strict diet and exercise regimen. He is not on any medication. His current BMI is 23. He was approved for surgery. Three days following the surgery, he was seen by his GP for a routine diabetic follow-up, and his blood results are as follows. His fasting blood sugar is 8 millimoles per liter. Random blood sugar is 11. HbA1c is 60. However, the urine analysis was negative for glucose and ketones. A renal function test showed values within normal limits. What is the single next best step in the management of this patient?
So in this question, we see that the patient is already suffering from established diabetes. And as part of his post-operative diabetes follow-up, his fasting blood sugar is 8 millimole per liter and HbA1c is 60 millimole per mole, despite uh, lifestyle modifications. So we, uh, this brings us to the fact that we need to begin with an antihyperglycemic drug regimen. Uh, but before that, we also need to see that his renal function test is normal and his uh, GFR rates are normal and uh, that he's not having any renal impairment. So we can begin with our first uh, choice of drug treatment, which is metformin. So to clarify this further, we will be going through various HbA1c targets and how the management is guided according to these levels. So if there's a patient whose HbA1c is more than 48, so we start this patient on lifestyle and dietary modifications and we aim for a target of 48. If, however, the level is not achieved, we start with our first antihyperglycemic drug regimen, which involves metformin, to achieve the same level of 50, 48. Yeah, so but there's a catch here that if we start the patient on metformin, uh, so the target is 48. But if the patient has any contraindications to metformin and we are starting for example on sulfonylureas so our target at this level changes to 53 instead of 48 and now but if the patient is on metformin and despite following lifestyle modifications and being on a single drug therapy the hba1c remains more than 48 then we then instead of jumping on to adding another drug we reinforce lifestyle and lifestyle modifications and we advise the patient to follow a strict diet regimen. Yeah and uh, if the HbA1c levels touches 58 or more we need to start with dual drug therapy which can be sulfonylureas to achieve the level of 53. Yeah so that makes sense it means that whenever the level touches 58 so that is the cutoff point for adding another anti-diabetic drug. So moving on further, we have a 33-year-old patient whose routine fasting blood glucose is that of 7.4. He is otherwise well and has no complaints of polydipsia and polyuria with no past medical issues. What is the single most appropriate next step in action? So in this case, the patient has a fasting blood glucose of 7.4, which comes under the diabetic range, but is not presenting with any symptoms of polydipsia, polyuria, polyphagia. So our next most appropriate step in action would be to repeat a fasting blood glucose. However, in a patient who presents with symptoms, we would perform just one test to diagnose diabetes. Yeah, so Jagyasa, I would like to know one thing that there are clinical scenarios in which I have seen that the patient is presenting with symptoms like tiredness and fatigue and there's only one lab value given. So would that be enough to diagnose diabetes or those symptoms? Because I feel that those symptoms are, are very non-specific. Yes, those symptoms are non-specific for diabetes and may occur for any disease. And in that case also, we would repeat a fasting blood glucose. Absolutely. So our next case is a 65-year-old man with a BMI of 33. He has been diagnosed with type 2 diabetes mellitus. Diet and lifestyle modifications have failed to control his blood sugar over the last three months. He has no known allergies and he does not take any regular medications. His blood results are as follows. EGFR of 79 ml per minute and a fasting blood glucose of 9 millimole per liter. What is the single most appropriate drug to start with? So if you look at this patient, his BMI is more than 30. So if there's any drug we have to start with, we will obviously think of metformin. Is that right, Jagyasa? Yeah, because apart from exercising and anti-diabetic effect, it also helps in reducing weight. Absolutely. So metformin is a preferred choice also in obese individuals. And so... Now, next thing, when we have to give metformin, so we have to look, look at EGFR levels, which are also in the appropriate range for giving metformin. And why are we thinking to give drug to this patient? Because we see that he has been having diabetes for quite a time and his lifestyle modification has failed to control his blood sugar levels. So now this is the step that uh, this is the time when we need to start with a drug therapy. 
because the fasting blood glucose is also in diabetic range. So our last case is that of a 55 year old man with history of type 2 diabetes mellitus that has been on trial of lifestyle modifications for the past three months. He is not on any medications for his diabetes and attends his GP surgery for his recent blood results which show a fasting blood glucose of 12.3 millimole per liter, HbA1c of 59 millimole per mole and EGFR of 28. He has a BMI of 33. What is the single most appropriate treatment to introduce? So in this question, we see that the patient, uh, despite being on lifestyle modifications, has a raised HbA1c. So which means that we that he needs to be started on an anti-diabetic drug. And looking at his BMI of 33, our choice of drug would that be of metformin. But his EGFR is less than 30, which is 28 here. That means that we cannot give this drug. So our choice of drug would be any drug that does not have an effect on weight or rather reduces weight. So in this case, we will be choosing DPP-4 inhibitors. To quickly summarize, when we are considering drug therapy in patients of diabetes mellitus, so our first choice is metformin, unless it's contraindicated. Now we move on to dual therapy when the HPA1C touches 58. So dual therapy can have metformin and any of the following drug and once the dual therapy is unable to achieve the target HPA1C and the HPA1C remains more than 58 then we can consider either insulin based treatment or this is the time when we intensify our drug therapy and move on to triple drug therapy. This is a summary of how therapy is intensified based on HPA1C. So we either use any of these combinations along with metformin if the patient does not have any contraindication to metformin or if we are considering insulin based treatment at this stage we let go of metformin and use insulin in such patients. Coming to an end to this quick sneak peek into diabetes and its management, we hope you found this video informative. And also the slides used on this video can be found in anyone can teach section in Flavable Gems on the Flavable website itself. Thanks for watching guys, so please don't forget to like, share and subscribe. And stay tuned to our Flavable YouTube channel for upcoming teaching videos.